All right, Matt Dream, I watched this struck 1 p.m. Eastern, so is it okay if I go ahead and kick us off officially? Yes. All right, let's do it. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Good afternoon, I should say, if you are on the East Coast, and good morning if you're on the West Coast or somewhere in between. Thanks for being here for today's Boomerang webinar, The Secret Thing That's Holding You Back in Your Nonprofit Career. And my name is Stephen Shattuck, and I am the Chief Engagement Officer over here at Boomerang. And I'll be moderating today's discussion, as always. And just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started here. I just want to let you all know that we are recording this session, and we will get you that recording as well as the slides. In case those missed you earlier today, we'll get you all that good stuff later on this afternoon. So if you have to leave early, Hope you don't have to, but if you do, that's cool. We'll still get you all the resources. You'll be able to watch it again, share it with a colleague, maybe even share it with a boss if, uh, if that's what you feel you need to do after hearing this great presentation. Never know. Uh, but have no fear. Just look for an email from me later on today with all that good stuff. Most important, my favorite thing, please chat in your questions and comments throughout the next hour or so. I'm going to keep an eye on those. I'll be pulling out some questions. We'll try to get to as many of your questions as we can before the 2 o'clock Eastern hour. So don't be shy. Don't sit on those hands. You've got a great expert here that is going to try to answer all your questions uh, before 2 o'clock Eastern. Also, you can do that on Twitter. I'll keep an eye on the Twitter feed there as well. If you'd rather uh, tweet us a question or just keep in touch there. And then last thing, if you're having any trouble with the audio through your computers, we find that the audio by phone is usually a little bit better since it doesn't rely on you know, technology or Internet connections or any of that good stuff. So don't give up on us completely. Try dialing in by phone if you can, if you don't mind doing that before you totally give up on us. There is a phone number in the email from ReadyTalk that went out uh, when you registered and uh, about 15 minutes ago as a confirmation that you can dial into. So try that. Uh, you should get better quality there. If this is your first Bloomerang webinar, I just want to say an extra special welcome to you folks. We do these webinars just about every Thursday. We only miss literally two or three Thursdays a year where we have a great guest like today's guest on for an uh, educational presentation. One of our favorite things we do here at Bloomerang, one of my favorite things for sure. Um, but if you're not familiar with Bloomerang beyond that, uh, check us out. Check out our website. You can get a peek at our really awesome donor management software. I know I'm a little biased, but it really is awesome. So if you want to learn more about us, check that out. Don't do that now. Don't do that for the next hour because you guys are in for a treat. One of my favorite humans of all time is with us uh, <laughs> today, Mazarine Trades. Mazarine, how's it going? Joining us from Portland. You doing okay? Yeah, yeah, man. Thanks for having me. I love being on your oh, webinars. Yeah. I think it's the second or third time I've done this for you. And uh, yeah. it's a fun time every single time. So. The best people on be webinars. Yeah. Well, you make it the best. You guys are Aww. really in retreat here. If you guys don't know Mazarine, guys, check her out. Follow her blog. Go to her events. She is um, a prolific organizer of a couple of, I think, the best conferences, educational opportunities in the sector. She runs the Nonprofit Leadership Summit, which is coming up. She's going to talk to you about that. She's definitely registered for that. Uh, last April, I think it was, Imagine is the mm -hmm. Fundraising Career Conference, right? I got that right. So you can catch yeah, that that's next right. year. Definitely yeah. check those out. She is nationally recognized, probably even internationally recognized if you count Canada, I suppose. Um, uh -huh. Great speaker. <laughs> if you see her on a conference agenda, go to her session. She's awesome. She is a prolific writer. She has written three awesome books. I got one of them here on my bookshelf behind me. I think she's sending me her recent one, so I'm looking forward to that as well. Uh, she's worked with all kinds of organizations, done trainings for AFP, uh, the U.S. Olympic Committee, Meals on Wheels, uh, GuideStar, ADRP. Um, she knows what she's talking about. So I have taken up way too much of your time uh, already, my friend. So I'm going to turn it over to you to tell us all about what that secret thing is that's holding you back. So take it away, my friend. Oh, thanks a lot, Stephen. Thank you. Um, everybody, thank you so much for being here. Um, I just want to say that during today's session, I'm going to be talking about some things that you might already know about. And if so, I'd love to have you speak up in the chat and give other people the benefit of your wisdom and your knowledge as well. I feel like we have a lot of knowledge in this room right now. And you are the authority on your own life and your experience as well as your experience in the sector. And I think we can all benefit from you. So please, 
please, when I ask questions, feel free to speak up and, and just say, hey, Mazarine, I think you're wrong, and this is why. And I, I really appreciate it when people tell me that because then it really leads to something interesting. So um, feel free today to be like, that's right, this is what I think. And, and I'm going to be very excited to hear what you think too. So even though it's a webinar, let's pretend that we're in person. So um, here's a secret thing that's holding you back in your career. It's kind of a riddle. Um, but uh, let's, let's keep going forward. So uh, this is me. Um, I, as Stephen said, I've done a lot of things. And um, I basically love to help people take their nonprofits and their careers to the next level. And that's why I run my two online conferences, uh, the Fundraising Career Conference and the Nonprofit Leadership Summit. Um, and that's coming up this September, and I'll tell you about that. Um, so here's my pop quiz for you right now. What's holding you back? What do you think the secret thing is? Is it your lack of communication that you're in a profit? Is it your community trust? Is it your donor database? Is it your brand? Is this for your nonprofit? You know, is it your fundraising processes? Is it your staff? Is it your leadership? What do you think is holding you back? Yeah, give us a chat. What do you think? Ah, uh, Tara. Yeah. And Lynn, we can't do hands raised. I think you're going to have to chat it in. Um, Holly, yep. Oh, interesting. Laura said manpower. Diane said leadership. Tara said trust. Um, Lizzie said previous job duties. Um, Ute said communications. Uh, Lynn said lack of staff. Excellent, excellent. Um, Elaine said bravery to just ask, and Kara said time. You know, all of these are true. Um, uh, Megan, board of directors. Yeah, there's a lot of things. Yeah, brand says Nalani. Yeah, Samantha said board support. Share said my lack of communications. Yep. Tita, you know, college degree, yeah, that actually really does hold us back, which is really, really crappy. Um, excellent. Everybody, these are such good um, answers. Uh, this is the answer that we're going to be talking about today, but those are all real and true as well. Um, it's trust. It's trust, and it's trust inside your organization and trust outside your organization. Um, so uh, that's what we're going to be talking about today, and this is more of what we're going to be talking about. So. The cost of not building trust in our organizations. How to build credibility even with yourself. Uh, Ten ways to build trust at work, as well as one key way to build trust with donors, which I know that we all need to do, but first we have to look inside before we look outside. Then we'll also learn three key elements of trust, seven phrases to set expectations, and putting it into practice. And I'm going to give you a framework to use to really shift the culture in your nonprofit should you choose to, and then I'm going to give you an opportunity to learn even more about that. So, um, so one of the things that I wanted to start with is a bit of levity. So we have a Dilbert cartoon here. And if you're calling in and you're on the phone in your car or whatever and you can't see this, I'm going to read it to you. So here it is. Um, Dilbert's boss is saying, how are you doing on your unspoken objectives? And Dilbert says, my what? And the boss says, I'm referring to the goals I have in my mind that I've never mentioned. How are those going? And Dilbert says, I'm totally nailing them. So you can see here that he's uh, talking about something that happens a lot in our nonprofits, as, as, as Share said, the lack of communications. Um, you know, Roger talked about communicating as well. I mean, it is about communication. You know, Megan said you know, misconceptions as well. And so um, when we think about the community, sometimes what we do is we recreate our problems internally with um, external problems. So, uh, if, if you're not communicating well enough, you might have to go inside and ask why. So um, here's the thing. Uh, our nonprofit workplace cultures are broken. We have so many barriers to doing our work well. Because of super jobs, we have way more work. We have to make more decisions than ever. Plus, because of at-will employment, we're worrying about getting fired. We try to work harder, so then we don't take breaks, and few of us work our proper hours. And we have few real metrics and systems. We're constantly busy, but at the end of the day, we might still say, what the heck did I get done? And so um, I actually stole this phrase, this last phrase from Ellen Bristol, who wrote Fundraising the Smart Way. And she's actually going to be speaking at our Leadership Summit about exactly what metrics you need to be using uh, in your fundraising office and, and your sales processes for getting new major donors. Um, now, I know this isn't about fundraising right now. This is about you and, and trust. Um, but these are some of the things that are really 
holding you back, and underneath all of this is, is trust. So super jobs is when you have to do four or five people's jobs um, in one job description. If you read the job descriptions out there these days, you see that you know, development directors are expected to be the events coordinator, the office manager, the uh, volunteer coordinator, the grants manager, and on and on and on and on, right? And major gift solicitor and, 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 right? And graphic designer. So um, I speak from experience. And uh, this is something that is a really big problem. And so to be able to push back on this, we have to be able to show why, why we need to do that. Um, and that's what I'm going to show you today. So um, uh, next one you know, I want to say is, how can we build trust with donors and the community if we don't know how to build trust with each other in our nonprofits? And what's holding us back? So the mantra is work like crazy, then crash. So um, I have worked like crazy, and then I have gotten really, really sick. Luckily, I've recovered. But I once had a doctor tell me um, when I got bronchial pneumonia that if I didn't go to bed for a week, he was going to put me in the hospital. Um, and that's really sad when someone has to tell you that. <laughs> and it seems that our sector just attracts people that are just very driven and focused and want to change the world and really, really want to give everything to the cause and everything to their jobs. And I was the same way. But when you work really, really hard like that and you don't think of yourself, as Thomas Merton says, the frenzy of the act activist neutralizes his work for peace. So because of all the reasons I just mentioned, you're going to feel like you have to work really hard because there's too much to get done, because at will, because um, you're just, you know, you're expected to do a lot and you want to achieve, but then you end up feeling disappointed that you didn't get everything done. I don't know about you, but I have a lot of days where I feel I didn't get done everything I wanted to get done and I had too much on my plate. Um, and that's like every day. Um, so, you know, perfectionism is the enemy of good. Thank you, Jacqueline. Yes, exactly. Um, so I want to ask you a question right now. And if you don't know this, you don't have to answer, but I'm just curious, like, what's the turnover rate at your nonprofit right now? Anybody have any ideas? Is there any uh, you know, HR, executive director kind of stats you can give me? Even just turnover rate in your you know, fundraising department would be interesting to know. Um, I asked this question yesterday on this presentation, and people said 23%, you know, 23%, uh, you know 36%. Um, Anne said, it's very high. Lindsay said, 10%. Yeah. So, oh, we have 0% turnover. Nice, Tara. Very cool. You are extremely rare. Um, and Jacqueline says, difficult to tell, depends on the department. Lisa said zero. Wonderful. Well, that's, that's really, really different, and I love that. Um, uh, way too high, said Adina. Uh, in lower level employees, Danielle said low. Um, uh, Megan said very low, because there's only four of us, very committed, very overworked. <laughs> um, Jacqueline said, we have some pe people who have been here for 13 years, others that leave within one. Yeah. And Danielle said, I'm a 30D within two years. That's a sign. Yeah, that's a definite sign. Um, Samantha said, higher with program staff, less with, with uh, management positions. Susan said, the organization had five directors in four years. I'm the fifth and the only employee. Oh, God. OK, that's, that's a pretty high turnover rate. Um, Tara said, same with our group. Only four of us all overworked, lol. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Renetta said, we recently had a large turnover in key staff members. That's, that's really telling. Um, Kara said, I've the third in my dev role in three years. I've also seen two people hired and leave in my year. Yeah, so this is all very, very good information. Thank you, everybody, for sharing this. Um, so uh, this is some, uh, some, some things that you may not know. The average tenure of a fundraiser in a nonprofit is between 12 and 18 months in the U.S., and in Canada, it's low as six months. And this is directly from a recruiter that I know that recruits for all of Canada. Um, so we are look, overlooking people currently employed in our organizations. We looked at making executive level higher, and then people get passed over, and then they leave. Um, and that's really sad. And what's behind this? So it actually comes from the Puritanism that America was founded on, where there's this concept called the elect, which if you read um, the uh, book Uncharitable by Dan Pallotta, he talks about that. You may have some problems with him as a person. I understand that. But his, uh, his concept was really fascinating to me about how uh, – if we assume in this country that if you have a lot of money, you therefore know everything about everything. So that's why we trust Mark Zuckerberg to fix New York schools and Bill Gates to fix malaria, right? 
it's because they're so rich they just must know everything. And so when you only make 10 bucks an hour or 15 bucks an hour, people assume that you're an idiot. And we see this with board members assuming staff are idiots and no matter how much turnover there is in the board or in the staff. It's like how can they all be idiots if you are all turning over? I mean, this is what's behind that essentially. So um, when you look for a nonprofit executive level role, in, in some ways if the board is choosing the executive level role, they're going to be choosing someone who has less experience and not more. So it can be such a thing as too much nonprofit experience. And isn't that sad? I mean, honestly, I've worked in organizations where the two executive directors had no nonprofit experience and they were just hired from the outside and they came in and did a terrible job. Um, so, uh, and they both got caught doing some underhanded things and both got fired. So um, I'm not saying that anyone who comes outside the sector is bad. I'm just saying that we're overlooking our good people inside. We're not nurturing our people inside the organization. And part of that is due to lack of trust. So um, I have a friend who works at a national nonprofit that's a chapter-based nonprofit. And she said her CEO is worried because she sees a lot of her best workers all over the country leaving the sector and going to for-profits. Why? Because they offer better working conditions, benefits, and higher salaries. That's why. Um, and so if we want to keep our good people, we really, really need to think about how can we keep them. But this isn't just me spouting off at the mouth. Um, if you think you can ignore this, guess what? Um, according to Signet Group's research of over 30 years, it costs your nonprofit over 100% of what a fundraiser makes a year to replace them. So even if you're only paying them $45,000, it costs over $50,000 to replace them with you know, productivity gap, a wind down period, a job vacant just for one month, um, you know, salary increase to a new hire, direct hiring costs, accrued vacation, all of these things, and if you don't have a, um, an HR person, these are not things that you think about. Personally, I was shocked when I saw these numbers, but there's an even more shocking number coming up on the next slide. Check this out. So look at this. It costs your nonprofit, um, if you have four people turning over, $198,000 if they turn over in year two, and then in year three if they turn over again, that's almost $400,000. And if they turn over in year four again, that's almost $600,000 to have turnover for three years running. And that's just crazy. And you might think, oh, there's just how are these numbers real? Well, if you buy Donors Centered Leadership by Penelope Burke, you can, you can discover all of the math behind these numbers. Um, but what I did is I made a blog post that distilled it. And if you want to see that, go to my website, wildwindfundraising.com. Um, but basically, I just copied what I wrote there and put it here. And it's, uh, it's a serious, serious problem. So we're, we're, we often just look at the money coming in, but we don't see the hidden costs going out the door with our good people. And if we say we want to make a better world, how can we say that we don't start inside our organization? So if you keep your good fundraiser, if you keep your staff, they will raise you so much more money. Um, you know, the hiring cost is only 7% uh, of what the funders, or nine percent of what the funders will actually be raising for you. I mean, who wouldn't want an extra half million dollars a year for their nonprofit? Um, it can it can really happen. So this is what you're losing when you don't pay attention to this key issue of retention through trust. So last summer, uh, British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Oregon, Washington, California were covered in smoke from forest fires. Why? Well, global warming and because of budget cuts, no one had been doing forest maintenance and tree thinning. I have a friend whose uh, family in Alberta used to do a lot of tree thinning, and uh, she's like, they haven't been doing it, and here comes all of the all of the smoke. So, what's more important than fighting a fire? Preventing the fire in the first place. So. Um, Sharia said, turnover is low for us, 10%. Staff is 20 years stable. That is wonderful. You are the exception. Um, so if we want to prevent the fire, let's ask ourselves, have you ever felt a disconnect or lack of trust between yourself and your boss? You can just type in the chat pane. People are saying, yep, yes, absolutely. Uh, Tara said, not really. That's wonderful. I'm so glad. Um, Kenzie said, so much. Jacqueline said, executive leadership, yes. Josh said, just yesterday. Laura said, in a previous job. Lisa said, no. That's wonderful. Jim said, definitely. Brian said, ever? Absolutely. 
Uh, Lorna said, not in this job, but past roles. Lauren said, yes. And lack of agreement of trust within the board members, said Danielle, yeah. Um, Stephanie said, not my boss, but we both feel it from our board. Yeah. Past roles, said Megan, excellent. All right, I can't read everybody's, but you, you're all doing so well here. Um, so next question for you. What do you think contributes to lack of trust right now at your organization? Just, just type it in. What do you think it could be? Silos, said Ann. Yeah. Micromanagement, said Kenzie, right? Lack of communication. Yes, not feeling heard, said uh, Katie. Lack of communication, said Lauren. Lack of operating funds, said Susan. No direction, said Jenny. Yeah. Too many unexplained departures. Oh my gosh. A lot of pressure, micromanagement, territorialist departments. Oh, wonderful. Missed deadlines and having to do major editing, said Juliana. Yeah, Samantha said long-term ED retired a new interim position. MB said mission drift. Uh, Pamela said competition. Yeah, uh, that's so good. Perception that success in one department means less in other departments, said Anne. Yeah. Amelia said leadership that doesn't always voice opposition clearly, and people feel disappointed when changes aren't implemented. Uh, Dory said boss is really in the office. Uh, Lauren said lack of board management. Uh, Mission Drift here too, said Megan. Lack of vision, said Lizzie. Desire to keep doing it the same way. Oh, isn't that so common? Oh, my God. Erratic management and leadership, said Nalani. Yeah. Um, Chris said, unwillingness for my boss to let go of jobs. Micromanaging, doubting ability because of age. Yeah, that's a real problem, oftentimes with founders. Um, officers and board members who get a big ego and blame the central office for everything, including their duties not being performed. Ooh, yeah, Stephanie, yeah, it's hard. Um, our leadership only chooses a few people to contribute to tasks. So, Sharae, thank you so much for that. Everybody, those are really big problems. And a lot of them really, really do stem from trust. So not necessarily vision, but the micromanagement definitely. So the extreme downside of lack of trust is a dysfunctional organization. We're going to go from like least bad to like um, most bad. So intense micromanagement, labeling others as enemies or allies, right? That's what we talked about just here. Someone said, you know, when one department gets a success, another department feels like they can't, right? Punishing systems and structures. So for example, I worked very briefly at a um, animal shelter, and in this animal shelter, my boss was uh, upset that I wasn't really like being open with her, and so she decided that I was going to um, have a uh, if I got there more than three minutes late, you know, for three days um, ever, I was going to be fired, and then I was. And so that's a punishing system and structure. Um, hot, angry confrontations or cold, bitter withdrawal. Uh, sabotage, grievances, lawsuits, and criminal behavior. Unfortunately, I've seen that in nonprofits I've worked at as well. Um, verbal, physical, or emotional abuse, workplace bullying. I've also seen that in workplaces I've worked at. That's why I'm passionate about this work. That's why I do this with you, because I don't want um, what happened to me to happen to you. And also, um, I want to take my pain and hopefully help other people not have that pain. So if any of this has grabbed your life and you don't have to say if it does, but I just want you to see this, it can go from this intense micromanagement to, to actual abuse. And the reason I put a calculator on here saying help is because, as we saw in the previous slides, your turnover is going to affect your ability to bring in money, um, to keep your money, and to do your mission. All of this stems from the machine that is made of people at your nonprofit. And your nonprofit is a beautiful machine, but if you're not oiling the machine, and, and, and taking care of it, it's just going to break down and crash. And like taking away different gears means it means the machine just falls apart, right? Even if you feel like a cog, you know, that's okay. We have to fix this machine to make it run. So here's the very low cost of not building trust. At very low trust organizations, you could see intense political atmosphere through camp, camps and parties, you know, painful micromanagement and bureaucracy, unhealthy working environment, excessive time wasted on defending decisions, and lots of staff turnover. Ahem. Uh, at the low trust organizations, you see common CYA behavior. CYA means cover your ass, right? So you're always telling everybody what you're doing, but you're also like trying to make it look like you're not going to get fired, hopefully, if you keep covering your ass, blaming other people, right? Hidden agendas, and many dissatisfied staff and stakeholders. Some people here talked about that too, how people are blaming them for their work not getting done. Uh, with a few trust issues, you might see 
misaligned systems and structures, some bureaucratic rules and procedures, slow approvals, and some dissatisfied staff and stakeholders. So um, these could be board members that are just getting yelled at by the ED. You know, that happens. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really messed up. With some trust, with trust is not an issue, you might see good communication, aligned systems and structures, and fewer office politics. With good trust, you might see the focus is on work, effective collaboration and execution, helpful systems and structures, and positive partnering relationships with staff, committees, board, volunteers, and donors. So um, one of the things I'm really working hard on this year for myself and what I'm going to uh, hopefully talk more with nonprofits about is how you can build more positive partnering relationships um, within your organization as well as outside your organization. And um, it's just, as people said today, silos really do prevent us from getting the work done. And mm, lack of trust because of silos and all the things that go with that, the communication just gets cut off. So imagine if you could effectively collaborate with everybody in your organization. And it could be all hands on deck for an event, and then you could all debrief and celebrate when it was done. I mean, imagine, you know, um, you get all the stories you need for your grant proposal right away. Or imagine, like, if programs need help, um, you can be there for them in, in a way that you, you know, an out, outreach event or whatever it is. Um, imagine, like, how could life be different and better in your organization? If your organization doesn't have a strong enough vision, we'll help you make that vision today in terms of how your workplace culture could be better. So with excellent trust, you see positive transparent relationships with volunteers, staff, donors, and board, effortless communication, high collaboration and partnering, and strong innovation, engagement, confidence, and loyalty. So here are three key elements of trust. Trust of character. So uh, when you have trust of character, you manage expectations well, you establish boundaries, like not staying after 5 o'clock, you delegate appropriately, you keep agreements, and you can be consistent. But if you're afraid that you're not doing a good enough job, or you're afraid you're going to get fired, or you're afraid that um, you have too much work to do and you haven't done it all yet, then it's hard for you to establish boundaries. It's hard for you to delegate, especially if you're a very small nonprofit. I know we have a lot of them on today. Um, and it's hard for you to be consistent because you are burning yourself out, right? So it's hard for you to manage expectations. So for example, um, when I lost one of my last jobs, I took another job even though I had very strong reservations because the boss said, I want you to raise me a million dollar grant in the first three months. And the whole budget of the organization wasn't even a million dollars. Um, so I failed to manage expectations there which led to lack of trust. I just really wanted this job and I said, I'll do what I can. And then he'd come in every day and say, where's my million dollar grant? And it really it would have been a better boundary for me to say, I can't get this for you. I'm sorry. You know, like we have to start with smaller grants first. Then we'll go to the big ones. And I did get them 120,000 in grants, um, which is more than like they got 7,000 the year before, right? So that was a really big jump, but it was still not good enough for him. So that's why when you go into a new job, you want to underpromise and overdeliver. But that's a separate thing. So um, trust is communication. So you want to share information, tell the truth, admit your mistakes. Uh, give and receive feedback, maintain confidentiality, and speak with good purpose. So I'll tell you how I screwed up here. Um, so Richard said, too many of unrealistic expectations. I agree. And is it, is it their fault that they have that? Or is it our fault that we didn't educate them about what realistic fundraising expectations are? You know, like they don't know. If you're an ED, you have a very complicated job. You are trying to manage the board, but you're also managed by the board. You're trying to do HR oftentimes. You're trying to do the budgeting and the finances, and then you're also trying to approve budgets and have meetings with people all the time and still maybe even do a little fundraising on the side and, 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 right? It's a very complicated job, and so if they don't know how to manage you or if they don't know what to do, it's our job to try to teach them. Oh, gosh. And Richard said, honesty has cost me opportunities. Richard, believe me, I knew that if I was honest with this person, it was going to cost me an opportunity as well, that opportunity to get that job. I totally agree. But that's actually the, that's the reason I called my business Wild Women Fundraising, because wild for me means speaking the truth, even if your voice shakes. And, and Nassim Nicholas Taleb in his new book called Skin in the Game said, speaking an unpopular truth, you know, if it costs you your reputation, at least 
you know, it, he said it's the most courageous act that he can think of. And so um, I, uh, I applaud that. And so that's sort of what I hope everybody here can start to do um, when you tell the truth. Oh, Danielle said, I need you to do a class on that board ED relationship management. I would love to. <laughs> um, so uh, when I was in one of my previous organizations, even though the boss was doing some very shady things, I was, I was not speaking with good purpose. I, instead of going to him directly, the ED, I was talking behind his back. And I'm sure he heard me at some point or another, and I'm sure he just was like, that's it. So, um, and I know that I shouldn't have done that now, but at the time I was like, it's the only way I can discharge my, my, um, my anger about what's going on and my frustration. So uh, I should have journaled instead of talked to people, and I should have talked to him directly, but I didn't do that. And so that really cost me trust with him as well. So um, trust of capability. You know, acknowledge people's skills and abilities. Allow them to make decisions. Involve others and seek their input, and help them learn skills. So um, this is something that healthy organizations do. And uh, when you all take the Strength Finder test for Gallup, for example, it's like 20 bucks, and you can find your five key strengths. And then you can say, look, these are my strengths. Therefore, I should be doing these jobs, and I should not be doing these other jobs. But however, these other jobs be better done by this other person who has these strengths. And um, one of the things that one of my favorite people in the world, Kishana Palmer, talks about is that when she is building an incredible fundraising team or incredible nonprofit team, and she's been um, a national uh, VP of external affairs for a national nonprofit, she um, asked everybody, no matter what your job title is, what do you like to do? So if the office manager likes to run an event, let them do that. If your development director loves doing major gifts and hates doing grants, let them do the major gifts and then try to farm out the grants to somebody else who loves writing your organization no matter what their job title is. And if you can do that, then you're going to be able to help them learn skills and build to the next level in their career by simply asking, what would make you feel fulfilled here? Like what, and anyway, we'll talk about that in a second. I'm getting ahead of myself. So here's what will help donors trust you because people asked about this yesterday and I thought I should add this. So um, I've found that in building a relationship, either a personal relationship, or a donor relationship, or a colleague relationship, asking good, deep questions makes all of the difference. And the energy with which you ask the question makes even more of a difference. So people listen to tone way more than listen to words. And so um, you know, recently I was in a relationship where this person did not ask questions of me at all, ever. And I was like, why am I feeling so dissatisfied? And then I realized it was because we were never going deeper. I'm like, well, how can we go deeper? And how can we build trust? And the answer was better questions. So unfortunately, this thing in, with this person did not work out, even though I told them I needed that. Um, but it really helped teach me this lesson that I'm now learned from my pain <laughs> teaching you today. Um, so what do you strive for? How do you challenge yourself? That can help donors trust you. Have you ever looked back in your mistakes and learned from them? Oftentimes our donors give to us because they've had a painful experience in the past and they want to not repeat that experience. What meaning have you taken from your mistakes or your suffering? That's another way to look at that. Um, Tara said our ED had, all take us, had us all take the Gallup Strengths Test. That's what it's called. It was great to be able to see where each other's strengths are. It helped understand why they do things in a certain way. Highly recommend for everyone. Thank you so much, Tara. Yes. Yes, because not only can it help you see what tasks to do, but it can also help you see how you communicate. So some of us have the relator strength, which means that you're going to want to sit down with someone and say, hey, how was your day? How's it going? What's new with you? Tell me about what you're studying in school. You know, whereas someone with a, a strategic strength might just be like, okay, let's get this done. You know, um, they'll be much more abrupt. And if you know strengths, you can also know communication styles more. Some people have woo, which means that they will go through a room and talk to everybody and have a good time and meet someone in five minutes, become their best friend, and move on. And that's great for a major gifts officer. But um, people might say, well, hey, I thought we were friends. We weren't going to hang out. And the woo person's already on to the, like, the third person. So um, if you know your strengths, then you know what jobs you can do. And it can also help you learn how to talk to people who don't have that strength and, and, and you know, come at them from a way that really makes sense for them. And I actually was working with an executive director with this last year, and she said, oh my God, Mazarin, like, now that I know that my 
events manager has the relator strength, even though I'm strategic, I go in and I get to hear about her day, and we've really been able to build up trust together. And it's just so different knowing that, that this is what she needs. She had another person on staff who would just love to go around and talk to everybody, and he also really liked to research and learn, and his strength was input. And so when you know that one of your staff has a strength of input, then you can say to them, um, hey, you know, would you like to take this webinar or this workshop or this class or you know, read some books about this or here's an article I thought you would like. They're going to love that and it's going to give them the reasons why you want them to do something and it will help you motivate them that much more. So this is a really key thing I'd highly recommend, just like Tara said, to everyone. So other questions that you can ask to get deeper with donors. Have you ever thought about the meaning of your life? What makes a meaningful life to you? Um, have you ever thought about your legacy? What kind of legacy do you want to leave? And at the end of your life, how will you know you have led a good life? What do you hope for future generations? So these are some deeper questions that you can sort of work towards asking your donors. And these can even become bequest conversations, honestly. Um, but not to be morbid, um, it's just we, we could all do better with that. So if your competitive advantage is your people, that means you have to keep, work on keeping your people, but how, right? That's what we're talking about today. Here's four phrases to set expectations with your boss. And if you're a boss, we'll also have phrases for you too. Um, but even if you're a boss, probably you could ask this of your board chair, right? Um, if they say to do something, you might say, I'm not sure what you're looking for. May I have some direction? Or I might be going off track or going down the wrong road. I'd like to check in with you. And then um, that way if there's any resentment or fear on their part that they're not expressing to you, uh, or even um, uncertainty that you can accomplish the task, you'll get it right out in the open. And hopefully also if you feel uncertainty, you'll be able to say, here's what I don't know. What, what do you really mean by this? Um, and so that way you won't go off um, and think you're going to be doing what the boss wants you to do and actually be not doing it. Um, Another phrase you can use is, I'd like to understand what your expectation is. What do you need from me? Another phrase you can use is, I want to do my best. I'd like to schedule some time to review your expectations and make sure I understand what you need from me. So when you do this, it can be extremely powerful to start to rebuild trust that has been broken down. Three phrases that expectations with staff or volunteers. Um, this is a picture of Saturn. Uh, he is the great teacher. He's the dad, and he'll say, you know, I'm not just, I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed, you know. So um, you can ask, are these expectations realistic? Do you see stumbling blocks I haven't addressed? So even though that there's a power dynamic that's different between you and the person who's directly reporting to you, this is a way for you to equalize it and hopefully make them feel more comfortable in saying, here's what I see. Now in capitalism in, you know, in gender roles, we've often been taught to not make waves or not ask questions or not um, push back when somebody gives us an unrealistic expectation. And, and some people here have also said unrealistic expectations um, that were really hard for them to meet. Here are uh, hopefully some phrases that your boss can learn to hopefully ask, is this realistic? And then, then hopefully you feel comfortable enough to say, oh, actually, that's not realistic. I wish my boss had asked me this. Um, another way to say this is, is there anything you see that might become an issue down the road? You might say, yeah, you know, you wanted us to do all of these things, but we don't have a database. So even if we call all the donors and, and get ideas about them, not having a database or a database where we can add donor records easily is going to hold us back from actually being able to accomplish our goals because I can't hold us all in my head and spreadsheets just make my eyes cross. Um, so if, you, if your donor database is a spreadsheet, I'd highly encourage you to not do that. Um, so if your boss is asking this question, say, please invest in this program. If we don't have a budget for continuing our education or for fundraising, we are a program just like every other program and we deserve to have a budget. Um, so, and then another phrase you can say is, before we say goodbye, do you have everything you need from me? And um, that's wonderful because then if the person is like, ooh, I want to say this, oh, no, we're finishing the meeting, ooh, mm, mm, you know, then they can finally uh, actually get to that question. So 
How to keep your good people? Try decent work. What is it? These are the seven elements of decent work as a starting point that the Ontario Nonprofit Network has identified. Um, they're actually an advocacy organization as well. They're the only big association for nonprofits in Canada, but they're managing to get some of these passed into law, and that is so exciting. So they've identified that people have precarious work. They don't have enough benefits. They don't have you know, mat leave and paternity leave that is adequate. Um, they don't, you know, no pensions. Uh, you know, not uh, raises are not incremental or like based on performance, um, and uh, all of these things. These are things that we need now um, to fix. And so here are the ones ways they want to fix it. So opportunities for development and advancement, equality and rights at work, culture and leadership, employment opportunities, like we talked about before, um, rising from within, fair income. Uh, we know that our wages haven't risen since the 70s. So if we actually redistributed the wealth that exists in the U.S. right now, um, every single one of us would be making $160,000 a year. Boom. Right? So imagine if you made that. How good would your life be? I mean, you don't have, money isn't everything, right? But neither is suffering because you don't have enough money to like, go to the grocery store or fix your car. Um, when I had my job in the domestic violence sector, I was buying groceries on credit, and I, you know, I could not afford what I was paying, so getting paid. So, um, and then when I had a car accident, that really threw a wrench into things. Um, health and retirement benefits, stable employment. Um, so all of this, and uh, for some of us, you might say, well, we have at will in our state, we can't have that kind of stability, but perhaps you could make an employment agreement or employee handbook that would supersede that, that would you know, really make it clear, this is what we stand for, treating our people well, and we're not just going to fire you for no reason. So culture and leadership. You can be proactive and take initiative and responsibility for results. You can ask, what problem can I be proactive about today? So um, opportunities for advancement and development. When Peter Drury spoke at our Nonprofit Leadership Summit last year, he actually um, has built wonderful fundraising teams, but when someone comes in first to his office, he says to them, he sits down and says, what are your career goals? Where do you really want to be in five years? And don't tell me here. How can we nurture you in your goal to be successful? So we really want to see you succeed. And if you do that, if you do just this one thing as a leader in your organization right now, um, either you know, as you move into leadership or if you're already a leader, um, people will be begging to work with you. They'll be like, oh, please let me work with you. Oh my God, I would love to work with you. This is going to be the best because you're going to actually mentor me and support me and partner with me to help me succeed. And you're, know, you're going to know that I'm not um, here forever, but I'll do my best for you while I'm here. If you show interest in them as a person this way, it makes such a difference. You can ask yourself this question too, but when you're nurturing other people around you, it really makes a whole shift in the energy, and the culture of your nonprofit. So you can't talk your way out of this problem, right? You could guess what's going on. You could tell people what's wrong. Or you could go for mutual exploration. And you can listen first and talk later. I mean, what if people want more transparency with salaries? What if they want equal pay? What if they want flexible and equal workplace? What if they have family responsibilities um, like children or aging parents or grandparents that they need to take care of. You know, you shouldn't penalize them for that. That's not okay. So equality and rights at work. Um, look for ways to show respect and strive for equality. So seek first to understand and emphasize with others and hear their perspective before sharing your own. So I think it was either Socrates or Plato who said, seek to understand, not to be understood. We're just going right back to the Greeks here um, and ask, who needs me to listen to them today? Um, as we said before, a lot of times in our organizations, they're hiring from outside when they should be looking inside. You know, your future CEO could be hiding in plain sight. So as we said, let everybody lead the piece that they do well. Who loves to do something that isn't part of their job? Let them do that. Uh, leverage their gifts and resources and see if you can promote them based on these aptitudes. So I'm just reinforcing what we said before about the strengths. Culture and development. You know, sharpen the knife of your mind and always work to get better. So ask, how can I renew my mind and energy this week? 
And another way you can do this is even have a book club inside your organization and say, hey, let's all read a business book and talk about it once a month. Um, I know we don't have a lot of time, but this could help us start to understand each other's ideas and values that are behind the reasons why we do things. And if we have something to talk about that can help our nonprofits, so much the better. So fair income, stable work, and benefits. And people often say, I can't. I can't. You don't have the money in the budget. It is never true. You can do better. And here's how you could do better. Offer more per hour and less hours worked. Um, you know, if we're not providing a fair and living wage to our employees, um, we can do better. Could we have more worker protection? Could we supersede the at-will work environment? Could we offer more benefits? Could we let people work from home? Could people have more vacation time? It's not just about the money, right? So here is something that's below everything that we're talking about. So we're talking about late stage capitalism. We're talking about you know, how to support our workers better. But why are we treating them badly in the first place? Because of the three pillars of white supremacy. So constant war and slavery, um, capitalism, uh, genocide and colonialism, and uh, racism, sexism, classism, homophobia. That's what's underneath, underpinning our nonprofit industrial complex. So what we're talking about today really stems from these key core issues that lie at the root of why there is so much inequity and sadness and poor workplace cultures inside our organizations. And thank you for sticking with me through to this very moment because I feel like this is something I really, really need you to get if you don't already know it. Um, as Mumia Abdul-Jamal says, you can't fight power if you don't understand it, and if you can't understand it if you don't experience it and then dissect it. So we're actually going to have, I'm really, really proud to say, a woman at our nonprofit leadership summit who's going to be talking about how to decolonize our nonprofits. And I'm so excited to have her present about this. I'm um, sure an article about it, and now she's going to turn it into a presentation. Um, and I just talked with her yesterday. This is happening. So um, this is happening in September. And if you really want to get to the root of what's going on, I'd highly encourage you to, to come to her session. So um, how to keep your good people and provide higher amounts per hour and lower hours worked, provide more worker protections, um, uh, superseding at will in our employment agreement, offer cost of living wage increases each year, offer more vacation time, allow people to make mistakes, offer better titles and professional development stipends, and build trust deliberately. That's all of this that we talked about today, right? Um, Megan said, thanks for bringing this up. You're welcome. Oh, Brian, you're welcome. Thanks. We all need to talk about invisible systems of power because if we don't, um, we're just going to keep recreating them, and that's not what we want. So to that end, if you want to learn more about decent work, we're actually going to have the Ontario uh, Nonprofit Network to discuss a new case, their, their case studies and findings at uh, the Leadership Summit online, and you can learn directly how to apply decent work to your nonprofit and build trust. Um, Kara said, how do we get this out to our bosses without getting them annoyed at us? Have them come to the event. Um, that's the answer. Um, you can say this is going to help us make more money, but then the secret message is also we're going to help them understand these power structures. I made this conference to talk to your bosses. Like, if you're a boss, I made this conference to talk to you. Um, I don't think that anybody is naturally, you know, trying to hurt other people. I think we're just built our system on the wrong structure. So. Um, here's some of the people who are going to be speaking at the summit. This person here is from the Ontario Nonprofit Network. Her name is Pamela. This is Della Ray. She's going to be talking about um, how to be a better leader. Kishana is going to talk about how to get more board members. Uh, Margie Fine, who's the former executive director of the North Star Fund, she's going to be talking about how to um, uh, get more grants. And she's got a lot of big history in, in program funding and stuff. Um, Pamela Groh is going to talk about how to lead and, and network as an introvert which if you're really an introvert, that's going to be fun for you. Um, we're going to have Kristen Kennedy talk about how to get that major donor meeting. We're going to talk about fundraising stuff, right? But we're also going to talk about the deeper stuff. Uh, we're going to have um, Sarai Johnson actually do a free webinar for us on August 15th on mission mirroring, how we recreate what we're trying to stop outside our organization inside our organizations. It's going to be really fascinating. Um, and we're going to have Daniel Hyman talk about, uh, and he's actually doing a webinar next week for us for free before he does the conference. Um, uh, like sort of how do you increase your abundance, mindset, how to have a bigger vision for your organization. Richard said several familiar faces. Oh yeah, if you went to the Bloomerang Conference and you saw Kishana, you know she's good. But she's, she's presented for me every single year, and she is the best presenter I've ever had. 
So um, you definitely don't want to miss her. Um, so when is it? Where is it? How much does it cost? This is it. It's online. It's September 24th, 26th, and 28th. Here are some of the presenters I just talked about. Um, and this is the cost. And this is the cheapest price. It's going to increase by $100 every month. But I am going to give you a um, – excuse me. Mm. Good. Um, by the end of the presentation, that, that will let you have $100 off right now. So what will you gain from coming? Uh, you'll learn new ways to get that major donor meeting. You'll build your fundraising board. Um, Daniel's going to talk about dissolving unconscious mental blocks around money to lead to your organization to new levels of prosperity. You're going to learn how to do new automation techniques to connect with donors that will save you weeks of time in a year. And actually, even just told me that Boomerang is building this into their software right now. They're going to be able to do automation of donor um, emails and surveys inside of Boomerang so that you'll be able to track and connect with people based around their values, which is what we talked about today, the questions that you need to ask donors. So um, this ties right in with what they're doing, and I think it's really powerful and really exciting. And I'm, I'm so um, happy that they're doing that because there is another um, software company that does this, but they have a very, very high barrier to entry, and it's so expensive, and Bloomerang is so much cheaper. So um, it's really good for us in small nonprofits. Um, so the web address for the summit is um, – I'll put it right here right now. It's register.nonprofitleadershipsummit.com. And then I'm going to send it to everybody. You can check that out. And um, you definitely want to get the coupon code too. And the coupon code right now is so sweet 100 and that will get you $100 off. So um, you want to discover your strengths in leading and networking as an introvert. Um, if you're afraid that you're not good enough to get major gifts or whatever, Pam Grow is going to talk about that. Um, if you want to find the hidden plan giving donors in your database, uh, we're going to have a guy uh, named um, John Wright from the Wright Approach in Australia talk about how he gets that out of your out of your data. And then, if you want to become more entrepreneurial in your fundraising office or in your organization in general, we're going to talk about that too. We have so many incredible presenters. This is like the best lineup we've ever had. I haven't only shown you a small fraction of people are going to be presenting. I don't even think I'm going to present this year. I think I'm just going to be MC, and I'm just going to let them fly. So, um, but we have two free webinars coming up if you want to get a little tiny taste of what's going to come. Um, Daniel and Sarai, as I said before, if you want to sign up, it's wildwomanfundraising.com slash events. Um, so I'll put that here as well. Um, you can go to the chat, and you can totally sign up for those if you want to. Uh, those are free, and that's when they're going to be. Um, so there you go. And uh, we are also giving away an um, e-course on how to make a fundraising plan for 197 value, but that's going to be inside the Leadership Summit. And um, you're going to get three days um, with two days of break to work deep on all the issues we covered today. So um, that's why I'm telling you about this, because I think it's really, really exciting. Um, and we'll also give you all the recordings to watch over and over. We'll give you Win-Win for the Greater Good book to help you partner with corporations and government better. And you'll get you know, fundraising techniques to help you raise over a goal in so many ways. So I can't wait to see you there. I really hope you come and join us. And here's the coupon code. Here's when it is. It's a Monday, Wednesday, and a Friday. But you will get all the recordings as well if you can't make everything. And if you have questions, or if you have comments, feel free to email me. This is my email address. Um, this is my phone number. It's really me. I'll just pick up right away. And I would love to hear from you. So um, thank you so much for being here. And now we'll take questions. Um, we actually did have a question earlier, which was, um, what's the exact name of the strengths test? Um, if you get StrengthsFinder 2.0, the book, um, it will, it's, uh, it's it's basically based on the Gallup Strengths Finder, and um, it's a small book, but it has a code in the back that you can use to type into their website, and then you will um, be able to have a book about the strengths as well as the link to take your test. And then it takes about 20 minutes, and um, so I would just order Strengths Finder 2.0 book um, from bookfinder.com or powells.com because they treat their workers better than Amazon does. So um, I'll just type book finder in right here. Book finder, and then it's called Strengths, Strengths Finder 2.0, I think. It's a meta book search engine. 
that I like to use because um, and you want to get it new because if you get it used, then you're not going to have the code in it. Um, so, uh, but it, it'll give you like bookstores all over the country that are independent bookstores, and we do want to support them. So, um, anybody have any other questions right now about um, anything we talked about today? About um, the three pillars of white supremacy, or uh, speaking your truth, or building trust. I mean, we could talk about trust all day. Like this is just a tiny taste. But um, oh, good. Lindsay said, "How do you encourage people to explore gifts outside their job description without them feeling like you're asking them to do more for the same amount of money with the same title?" That's a really good question, Lindsay. And I'm going to go back to what I said in I, what I stole from Peter Drury, which was, "Hey, I know that you're bigger than this job." And I want to know, what are your goals for yourself in the next five years, and how can I support you in those goals? And so when you start asking them that, then they can say, oh, well, you know, I really don't feel like an office manager. I'm really much more of a grant writer, and I'd like to be doing that, for example. And you could say, that's wonderful. I want to support you to get there. So let's try to get some duties on your plate that will help us justify giving you that role in the next six to 12 months. Um, and then if you have that open, clear conversation, Lindsay, where you show that you care about what their highest good is and what their um, personal ambitions are, they're going to do those extra duties because they want to see that light at the end of the tunnel with going from where they are to the, where they want to be. And if you take that test, if everybody takes that test, you can start to have that conversation as well. It's another, that's another doorway because then you can say, oh, well, your strength is is positivity. It seems like you should be more in front of people talking about our cause than you should be behind a desk here. And they may be like, yeah, I'd like to do that. Or they'd be like, no, I like where I am. You know, and that's okay too. It just starts to open up the conversation. Anybody else have any other questions? Is that helpful, Lindsay? Does that, does that give you an idea? Any other questions? I'm here. Or if you want to have a comment, if you want to comment on something, if you want to say, here's a way that I've built trust effectively, I would love to hear that as well. Oh, you're welcome. We have three more minutes and I'm here. So Danielle said, I think the strength finder will be valuable as I'm coming against years of fear-based leadership. Oh, Danielle, definitely. We want to stamp out fear at the root. We want to get rid of the fear and come from a place of joy and prosperity and love always. And isn't that why we're here, right? Isn't that what our missions are supposed to be is to make the world better. But if we're coming from this place of fear and lack and or activists instead of people who you know have this broader vision for the world, um, you know it, it almost poisons our work. It poisons the the atmosphere in our office, and it it really it hamstrings us for really making a positive change if we're not also thinking about how uh, how to treat our workers in the best possible way. Because then it's going to translate and trickle into everything else that we do. Um, Shara said, how do you get the board to contribute to the fundraising ideas when all is good with staff motivation and drive? We only need more funding at this time. Shara, that's a good question. Um, I would have a vision session with your board. First, ask them to dream big for your organization. That's their role. I mean, governance is their role, but also dreaming is their role. And they don't have to be the ones carrying this out. They don't have to be the ones you know, um, with the concrete ideas for how this is going to happen. But if they start to feel involved with the vision, then they're going to want to help fund the vision to succeed. You know how Pitbull says, ask for money, get advice. Ask for advice, get money twice. Ask for them their advice. Ask for their impressions um, of what you're doing and how you could take it bigger. And a wonderful book to share with them is the Blue Ocean Strategy that can really get them thinking broader. And I'll type this in the chat pane here, Blue Ocean Strategy. And that's something that's really helped, I think, a lot of leaders think bigger. Um, and so, oh, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So please say that again. So Pitbull says, ask for money, get advice. Ask for advice, get money twice. <laughs> I'm quoting Pitbull in a fundraising webinar. That's right. So um, uh, Bethany says, I believe it's important to be able to make mistakes. How do I create that freedom in someone who seems afraid to make mistakes but also needs help staying on track? I feel like I'm saying it's okay to try things. Be free. At the same time, having to be hard on her for work quality and getting things done. That's really hard, Bethany. Um, you know, uh, I would talk with her first about 
all the mistakes you've made or like just one that's similar to the one that she just made, right? And um, say, gosh, you know, even each staff meeting talk about mistakes that we made this week. And maybe that's hard and we do it one-on-one -on -one first. But I have a blog post every year about the mistakes that I've made. And honestly, when you're open about your mistakes, it really helps people trust you more. And that's something else. Gosh, that came up yesterday. I should add this to the slides. But anyway, I'll add it next time. Thanks for that reminder, Bethany. <laughs> Having a culture of experimentation. You don't have to call it mistakes. You know, you've never made a mistake in your life because you learned from it, right? So it's all about it. Um, Adrienne said, tell her we all make mistakes. No problem. Just make a different mistake next time. Oh, yeah. Danielle said, many layers in my org, bottom line, commission fatigue, and uh, I'm sure you meant mission fatigue and silos. This is very encouraging and giving me tools to continue to shift our culture. Yes. Thank you. Really appreciate that. I want to encourage you. Um, it is so important to, to change our cultures. And yeah, be, having it be okay to make mistakes, it's a big one. I've been slapped on the wrist and given like a, a real reprimand for very, very tiny mistakes in my organizations, and that was something that really hurt my motivation and ability to succeed in these organizations as an employee. Um, uh, Richard said, say hi to PDX for me. I think that's where we originally connected, CNRG or WVDO. Yeah, hey, Richard. Thanks for coming on here. Um, yeah, Portland is beautiful right now. And it looks like we're just over time. Does anybody else have any other questions? Um, I want to make sure that I respect your time. Oh, thank you, Sheree. Thank you. Um, if not, here's my, if you, if you don't want to say it out loud in front of other people, that's okay too. Here's my email. Here's my phone number. Feel free to give me a call. Feel free to email me. Um, I'm here. Um, I'll toss it back to you, and you can wrap us up. Awesome. How do I toss it back to you? How do I do I'm that? here. You just did it. Oh, you yay. It. Awesome. <laughs> Stephen, I toss it back to you. <laughs> this is awesome. I always, I always love, love, love uh, listening to your, your training, your presentation, because it's it's cathartic and uh, inspiring at the same time. So thanks for being with us again. Uh, this cool. was a lot of fun. Thank <laughs> you so much, Stephen. Thanks for having me, everybody. I maybe said some challenging things today, but I want you to know that I did it with love, and I want you to be successful, and that's why I said it. So. Yes, we all do. And thanks to all of you for listening uh, today, taking an hour out of your day. It's always fun okay. to have you. Um, we have got – some great webinars coming up. We're actually taking next week off, but we have two webinars in two weeks from now, and the first of which is coming up on Tuesday, special Tuesday edition. We've got Julia Campbell. Uh, if you are in the Boston area, you may know her. You may have seen her speak at some events. She's going to talk about uh, public relations. If public relations is maybe something that you struggle with, or maybe you've got a communications person on your team, tell them about this. Have them uh, register. It's totally free. It's going to be a lot of fun, and we'll definitely get you an invitation to our webinar on the 26th, uh, also at 1 p.m. Eastern. So be on the lookout for invites to both of those sessions, and hopefully we will see you again um, in, I guess it's 12, 12 days from now, right? Yeah, the 12th or 24th. Mm -hmm. So we will send you a recording. We'll get you the slides if you didn't already get them. Definitely check out uh, the Nonprofit Leadership Summit and email Nazarene take advantage of our coupon code and all that good stuff because it's a good event, obviously. Um, so we'll call it a day there. Have a good rest of your Thursday. Have a good weekend, and we will talk to you again soon. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. You've been wonderful. Thanks, Stephen.